All right, Front Row Dads, welcome to the show. This is the place for family men with businesses, not businessmen who happen to have families. And today, I'm very excited to have Kim Anami with me. Kim, welcome to the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And I love what you just said, family men who have businesses. That's wonderful. It was, uh, you know, this whole thing started, uh, I'll let you know, not because I felt like I was crushing it in marriage and as a dad, but because I felt like I was getting crushed and I felt like I, I needed help. So we started the group because I wanted answers. And so we started searching and um, it's been quite the journey. We now have uh, quite a few men that are part of this wanting to be better men. And they're some of the best dads and husbands I know already, but they just want to be better. Um, well, that's the way it is. People know there's always another level to go. And even if you're really good at what you do, that's how you stay good at it is you're always one step ahead of yourself, even in challenging yourself to be that next level better. That's right. And let's talk about what you do. So uh, your bio is quite interesting. In fact, I thought about, you know, the, even reading that bio would be challenging because uh, there's a lot to it. Um, but how do you sum up to men particularly what you do? Well, I'm a holistic sex and relationship coach. And so I work with women, men, couples, penises, and vaginas. And so, you know, all of the above. And I really help people to harness the power of their sexual energy. And often when people hear, oh, so you're a sex therapist, so you help people with problems. I'm like, well, kind of. But what I really do is think about how to up-level people and help them to realize what's truly possible with their conscious use of their sexual energy. So, you know, in my book, every man can be having multiple orgasms. Every man can have sex for hours. Every man can bring his partner to cervical orgasms, G-spot orgasms, ejaculations that hit the ceiling and be able to separate orgasm from ejaculation. And then most people's jaws drop because they're like, what is that stuff even possible? <laughs> you know, or that women can have all of these orgasms and be multi-orgasmic and gushing, lubricating through menopause, child, uh, uh, early childhood pregnancy stuff where we typically are bought into these stories that, oh, no, 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 your sex drive is going to plummet at that time. Oh, no, 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 it's normal after you have children not to want to have sex for about five years. You know, all of these really um, mythologized excuses and rationalizations that people just buy into because they don't really know any better. And that's the dominant messaging out there. So all of my work is really how to up level. And then one of the areas I'm most passionate about showing people is how sexual energy can be used and as creative energy out into the world. So if you're not making babies with that energy, you can take that energy and infuse it into every part of your lives, especially your business. You know, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a creative. And so I'm all about, I often say hashtag powered by vagina. I've created my business through tapping into my sexual energy and using that for my creative ideas, my marketing ideas, and to boost my bottom line, you know, to really like paint my entire business with this level of inspiration and creativity. Well, there's a lot of places we can go with all that. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, and I, I really wrestled, Kim, even thinking about where to start here. And I kind of laughed to myself about how fast can I get into this, knowing that we, you know, and oftentimes we're talking about intimacy, taking your time. And I thought about this, you know, this is a conversation that I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to waste time getting to the good stuff, because I also think you're really good at just saying it like it is. I mean, if I remember the first time I listened to your podcast, I was like, whoa, Tim, <laughs> Tim Nikolai had, you know, had, had said, you got to check. He was sending me links to your show. And um, I was blown away by not only how open you were and how, you know, just how transparent, but also how spot on you were about some things that I, I really resonated with, but also the goals, the things that you had set out to say, oh man, I didn't even know that, for example, you talk about three different orgasms for women, you know, and, and there's things that I was like, oh, I've got a lot of room to grow here. I've got a lot of, you know, I need knowledge. So I'm excited about this. Maybe we can begin with the feminine and masculine energy as a place to start. Um, you know, this is something I've been, I've been thinking about, I've been aware of, I've read about this, but what's your take on masculine and feminine energy? Well, I really do believe in the idea of polarity. Like we live in a world of duality. Like, you know, most spiritual teachings will say to you that there are higher planes of existence where we do not have duality, where there's oneness. 
us. But we here on the physical plane, there's light, there's dark, the sun, the moon, there's yin, there's yang, there's masculine, there's feminine. That's just a natural part of life. And the idea in sexual polarity is that most people, most women have more feminine energy, more men have more, most men have more masculine energy. And these are archetypal energies, right? Where feminine energy might be described as this idea of being in flow, receptivity, openness, surrender. And masculine energy is more about like drive and exertion and getting things done and being out in the world. And we all have different, you know, expressions of these within us and can be quite fluid. But sexually speaking, the most chemistry, the most sparks fly, the most passion happens when we have more exaggerated polarity. So when we have a more, someone say a woman who's more on her feminine and a man who's more on her masculine. And then of course you have the phenomenon of Fifty Shades of Grey, which came along and sold one of the best-selling books of all time, making pussies wet all over the world, like reading this book in the subway, make, leaving little puddles on the seat when they get up, like so aroused, like because they're craving, women were craving this energy that they probably couldn't even articulate, which was like a strong, passionate, wild, masculine man, a very dominant, confident man. And, you know, we come to this place where we've neutralized our energies, where where women have taken on a lot more masculine energy and because they think they have to, to achieve in the world and to get things done and make it in a man's world. And then men have taken on a lot more feminine energy or tried to really stuff down their masculine energy and power. And, but deep down the sexes are most nurtured by and nourished by the feeling into the opposites that we have in each other. So, you know, despite us being in this time right now of gender neutrality and even neuterization, like I'm all about really amplifying the power of the masculine and the feminine to create the most you know, chemistry and long lasting passion in a relationship. So I'm sure this is a topic that you've explored in this group before. Yeah, absolutely. And it brings up a lot of other questions around polarity. Um, you know, for example, you know, when polarity is lost, right, how is it regained without being, and, and maybe, maybe it's not without something, but how is it regained? Maybe we just leave it at that. How, how do people recapture polarity? Because I'm guessing that when, it's, when a relationship is fresh, when it's new, that polarity is oftentimes um, easier to tap into. At, le at least that's my experience in conversations with people. But over time, people try to turn their, 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 the excitement of their relationship, which they first felt into, they try to turn it into like their best friend. They try to make everything the same and equal. And the, there's the problem with that because you probably didn't want to marry your best friend. Otherwise, you would have just spent a lot of time hanging out with your best friend. But this polarity and this, this uh, attraction to one another, if it's lost, how do you get it back? It's a great question. And I, but I think some people do want to marry their best friends because it's safe. Yeah. You know, like I think what happens is that we get, you know, we start into a relationship, we dive in, we're raw, we're vulnerable, and then we get to a certain point and people don't know how to get past that. Right. Like that's why there's this kind of idea of the two year plummet. It's not that that's supposed to happen. That's because people don't know how to go deeper with each other. Yeah. And so I think that when you're in real raw polarity, that's very vulnerable. It's very deep. It's very intense. Right. And so you're really reaching these depths sexually, intimately, emotionally that you can't when you're just buddies, when you're just good partners, you know. And so people who avoid those depths will then kind of slip into that buddy partnership role. And because it's safe there, they don't really need to reveal themselves and expose themselves. So I think part of getting to reestablish or even establish polarity that may have not even been there is acknowledging that this is okay, this is what's been going on, because this dynamic happens in every single couple. And usually when they hear about it for the first time, they're like, oh, that's why this, this, and this. That's why I get angry with him when he doesn't take the lead. And that's why I've taken the lead because he's not taking the lead, and I, but I don't want to be taking it, and I'm taking it like as a woman, right? And then men get into this position where they're afraid to really speak the truth and take the lead because the woman just like pounces on them and belittles them and, you know, criticizes them. And so it's this vicious circle. So it's acknowledging, okay, this is what we've got ourselves into right now. This is what we've devolved into. 
do we both agree that we want to shift this dynamic and regain this kind of polarity, which is the man typically then working on amplifying his masculine and the woman really inhabiting her feminine. And then it's looking at, well, what does that look like for us? You know, for example, I would say that at times that's like, like one of the assignments they'll often give men in the whole reestablishment of polarity is he has to plan a date night. So let's say Friday night, he has to pick the venue, pick whatever it is, like to the restaurant, the movie, the food, then he might even go so far as to pick his woman's outfit and lack of underwear and certain shoes that she's wearing. And then he just says, you know, be ready at six o'clock. And she's like, where are we going? He's like, shut up and get in the fucking car. You know what I mean? Like she doesn't get to say anything. And he, I'm assuming you've had some discussions about polarity right now. <laughs> I can just, this isn't completely new or else it might sound a bit much. Um, I but, mean, it could be, yeah, let's be honest. It could be new to some folks, right? Listening sure. to the, yeah, of course. Well, all right. So maybe if then in that case, he wouldn't be shut up and get in the phone card, but it's just like, honey, I've got everything taken care of. Get in the car and we're going. Right? Yeah. And just hike that dress up a little bit further as you're sitting next to me and I want to see that lack of panties. That's really nice. Now sit there and be yeah. quiet. Take her to the restaurant, order yeah. her food, you know, like be the complete dominant decision maker and wear that energy for several hours, right? As practice. Yeah. And then, so, and then the woman is going to practice not taking charge, not jumping in, not second guessing, not trying to grab the reins back, right? That's her practice. And so then we commit to that practice ongoing to rebuild that polarity. And then there may, there's a transition phase of, okay, he's going to fumble and not take control or just kind of go, okay, yes, honey, and not really assert what he wants. She's going to jump back in and try to gain control. And so they have to work through that and try to call each other out on it in the most loving possible possible ways and then start to move into these you know more established new habits of occupying these different energies and each other have you seen it work uh in the opposite in the opposite where the female has the masculine energy have you seen because i know i know some couples where it feels that way like she's definitely got the masculine energy and well, i see that happen but they yeah. come to me when they come to me and and you know some people in the polarity world say oh the woman might have more masculine energy and the man could have more feminine energy i've never seen it work and so meaning that when couples come to me and that's the role that the roles that they've evolved into they're yeah. not happy there like yeah. she's quite secretly resentful. He's bitter about it. They're actually not happy. And when I scratch underneath the surface, it's like she's kind of polarized herself into that opposite role as the protection mechanism because yeah. she didn't feel like he could fully handle it. So she had to take charge. And then he's in this other role because he didn't feel like he was confident enough to go forward. And yep. so when I do this deeper work with them and I uncover that underneath that, they actually end up moving, gravitating back towards she's in the feminine, he's in the masculine, and they're happier that way. So I look, and this is 20 years of me doing this work in polarity, and I've never seen it. So I'm not, it could possibly be out there, but it's kind of like, you know, people have stories that they tell themselves to rationalize decisions that they've made and protective barriers they've put up. And often, all the time, when I speak to them and I get under the surface, that's usually, it's well, never, so far thus has never been the true reality is that they actually occupy those other spaces. So I like the idea of men stepping up. I like the idea, especially in our group, we talk about with front row dads, um, we want to we want to fight against this this idea that dads are bumbling idiots. There's a lot of stick, there's a lot of jokes around about that. In fact, you know, I tell oh, yeah. I tell this story regularly that somebody who I really respect had posted not too long ago on Twitter uh, something like uh, I was getting a haircut and the woman said, "Do you want a dad haircut?" And then the response was like something like, "Can we all agree that anytime you add the word dad to something, it makes it not cool?" Right? And I was just like, "That's exactly." what I want to fight against because I want when people, when like guys in our group, I want them to be healthy, wealthy, wise, fit, you know, just like guys that people look at and go, that guy's got it dialed in on many levels. Like he's got a great business, but he's got a great relationship with his wife. He's present with his kids. He's, he's taking care of his body. Like that's the group we want. Right. And uh, I want to create more masculinity within our group, uh, not within our group, but within men all over the world. And part of the challenge that I see, Kim, and I'd love your take on this is like when I hear things like step up and lead or be more dominant or that women want that confidence, I feel like in my life I've stepped over the line there at times. And maybe you have to to figure out where the line is. But 
I even go back to like when I was dating prior to my wife being married to my wife uh, now of 10 years. But somebody had said to me, like, girls like it when you talk dirty, you know, they, they were kind of like <laughs> teaching me. And I was like with this girl and I tried to say something, you know, kind of dirty and I immediately turned her off. And I recognized that it may not be just in, uh, it might have been in how I presented it. It might have been the way I shared it. But do you find that when men are trying to reclaim their, their, their masculinity, their power, right? When they were trying to step in and lead, the, you know, what challenges are they up against and what guidance could we give them? What have you seen with your clients, right? And how they do that? Because I can imagine some of our guys are going, I get it. I need to step up. I need to lead. I might need to be more dominant, but how? I'm a little, I'm a little hesitant there. Well, I think for one, in, when it comes to intimate relationships, there's a big difference between a dating scenario and established relationship, right. a committed relationship. And so, you know, there's this big thing out in the vernacular there that's like, consent is sexy like you should always ask for permission before you have sex with a woman and I'm like uh no you shouldn't I mean meaning okay like in a dating situation okay fine if you're not very good at reading signals and you, you really think that asking is the thing all right so be it that's whatever but in an established relationship that's the least sexy thing that a man can do is like um honey uh if you're um not busy later maybe would you maybe want to have sex with me no woman's gonna say yes to that the woman's gonna be like i have so much laundry to do i've got a couple of root canals that need doing like she's gonna <laughs> avoid that energy right. that timid unsure energy because the ultimate question that a woman is asking every man who she's intimate with is if i fall will you catch me and if the energy is not strong and solid, you know, she's going to just be repulsed. She's going to move away from that energy and she'll avoid it. And so I think that, you know, like what I say to my clients and people I work with, men, is like, you take your woman, you initiate sex, you take her. And if, you know, you have an agreement, you maybe have this discussion then as you're moving more into polarity of like, okay, you know, and if she wants, if it's a no, she'll say no. And that's it. Of course, a no is a no, but it's like you just initiate. If you go up to a woman and instead of doing what I just did, you pin her up against the wall, you put her arms up over her head, you like open up her knees with your leg and you, you know, grumble and growl and nuzzle into her neck with your stubble, she's going to be like melted on the floor and you can just pick her up over your shoulder and toss her over onto the bed. That's what women love. So I think in terms of intimate relationships, if you're gradually moving into polarity, like I said, you have this transition phase where you can start talking about clear cut examples with your partner, whether that's sexually or just out in daily life. And then you have this understanding of like, okay, if I stumble a little bit, that's okay. And the woman can then say like, okay, that was maybe a little bit too much or that could be stronger. Like you can give constant feedback if you're having that dialogue to the point where then you just start to know instinctively like what works or from experience and what doesn't. But I think that the more a man really develops that, if, if a woman gives him permission to rely on his intuition, right? So it's like, we have this myth out there that women, women's intuition, as though men kind of in the stereotype you're talking about, men are these bumbling idiots and they don't know, they're like, oh, I see, I want food, I want sex, you know? And that's like the end of it. Where the men I've met, are extremely intuitive like men have an incredible intuition and I think even the more alpha they are their intuition tends to be more pronounced like more sensitive even and so you know I think that once they're given the permission to occupy that space and feel into their own intuition and their own desires that gets stronger right it's like you turn up the volume and you hear that voice better you get more confident to act on that voice so I think it is a process and a communication with one's partner and here I'm assuming that as we're calling this front row dads were talking more about committed relationships and not yeah. so much about dating, yeah, right? Definitely. So um, in those situations, it's an ongoing communication. But typically, if the energy that's presented from the core is authentic, confident, the man can pretty much do anything. Because what the woman's really tuning into is that energy. It's not so much the actions. It's that energy of, if I fall, will you catch me? Are you a solid pillar of strength that you can contain? Like when a woman reaches these heights of like cervical orgasms and juice belt orgasms, and she's screaming and crying and like pounding against the wall, the man needs to be able to handle whatever comes out of her. And if he's like, oh, get me out. I don't know what to do. Like then she won't go there again because yeah. it's not safe. 
And so the more that the, the man is constantly reinforcing those messages, even in small, like chivalrous kind of gestures, like opening the door for a woman, getting a coat for a woman, I think all of those things are beautiful, gentlemanly expressions of holding a container for the woman emotionally and sexually so that she can reach these heights of surrender and deep, deep, deep cataclysmic vaginal orgasms where she's shattered open and that she totally admit into that feminine space and that he can hold that space for her. Yeah. I love this. And I, I'm looking at the clock going, oh man, I wish I had three hours. <laughs> I've got like a hundred questions and you know, we've got only a limited amount of time here. Let me give you a choice, Kim. Let me give you a choice of where we go here. One is I want to get right into like literally talking about you know, sex in the bedroom, the three different orgasms for women, even like your, your commentary about the three hour sex date is amazing. There's some great commentary there. Cause I guess men are, I'm, I'm betting men are asking, all right, teach me more about sex. At least that's where I've been over the last year and a half is realizing there's a lot more for me to learn. And, and by the way, I feel good that I've, because of a lot of your help, for, so thank you. Um, my wife should be thanking you, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, so I want to talk about that. And I also want to talk about, and you can choose which direction we go here next, but the other one is about radical honesty in a relationship, the emotional part, because I feel like that that's sort of a logical next question, but I want to, I want to give you the opportunity to take it where you want. Um, well, let's start with sex. And I would say like the, the number one most important tool that a man can build is stamina, yeah. right? 75% of men ejaculate within three minutes. And that is completely unacceptable. And no woman is ever going to feel sexually satisfied with that kind of experience. Yeah. And instead, what she'll start to do is avoid sex right? She'll be like, oh, I've got a low libido. Oh, whatever. Oh, I've got children now. I'm breastfeeding. Oh, it's not that. That's not it at all. It's because you're fucking her in three minutes and bailing and you're totally pulling the carpet out from underneath her. That's why she doesn't want to have sex with you. So be honest with yourself. If you're in that category, that's what's happening. So I've got some great videos up on YouTube. I've got a sexual mastery for men playlist on YouTube. There's one called how to last longer in bed. And I've also got um, a sexual mastery for men preview video series on my website in my salon section that is giving instructions about breathing techniques that men can use to extend their stamina. And I've seen men go from three minutes to an hour within a few days of practice. So it can be very powerful. But for a woman to get to these deeper orgasms. And in my world, I'm all about the vagina. The good stuff is in the vagina. Most people think that a woman's sole orgasm is a clitoral orgasm. And I say, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Literally, that's 10% of what a woman can have. And every, every woman on the planet, I make this guarantee, can have G-spot orgasms, squirting orgasms, cervical orgasms, all of them, and like 10, 15, 20 in a row, she just needs the right tools to unlock her. And a man having great stamina is definitely one of those tools. And that energy of, if, uh, if you fall, I will catch you. And so these deeper orgasms are a woman's daily bread. If a woman is sort of like, yeah, around sex, it's probably because she's only ever had three, three minute fuckers or clitoral orgasms. And both of those experiences are, are going to leave her with like, ah, you know, sex is all right, but like, what's the big deal? No kidding, because all the good stuff is in these other deeper orgasmic experiences in the vagina. So I encourage people to go deep. <laughs> That's where all the good stuff is. And again, on my YouTube channel, I've got some videos there about these different orgasms. I have great videos about yoni massage and lingo massage, because one of the great ways to activate the yoni for the woman to kind of wake her up to the potential that's in her vagina. One is vaginal weightlifting using a jade egg, but two is doing yoni massage. And she can do that on herself, but it's much more exquisite when done by her partner. And a way that a woman can help a man reconnect to his cock you know, so many men are victims of circumcision and that creates like a numbness and dissociation, dissociation in the cock is that by doing genital massage on him, she can help him reconnect to that area. And, you know, I feel like a lot of that premature ejaculation really is coming from all of the, you know, mass amounts of circumcision that are going on in America. Yeah. 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 Good point. 
Um, when you think about keeping something fresh or leveling up for most guys, and I think that the resources that you've shared are great. I love that you've got this course coming up, the sexually, sexual mastery for men. That's great. Um, and, and it's, it's good that we have these resources now for guys to go learn, because like I said, I, being totally transparent, I would say for the fir- for the last 10 years of our marriage, I was, I was, I was falling short you know, uh, in this area with my wife. And I wasn't, um, really taking charge. I wasn't, I wasn't the guy that you're describing, (laughs) you know, that, uh, but over the last year and a half, we've really been working on it and it's made huge differences in our relationship. Like it's, I'm, I'm actually shocked. So I'm glad to see that we were able to go to the next level, but now I'm thinking to myself, what's the next level after that? Right. So I'm actually up against this. Like, what's the next level look like? How do you keep it fresh and exciting and new when you're like, well, what, what else do I do? I think I've run, I've run through all the positions. Like, you know, like if this is where a guy is out there saying, what else can I do to keep it fresh? What's your thought on that? Well, I would ask if the man is able to separate orgasm from ejaculation. Does he give his woman 10 cervical orgasms in a row? Can he make his woman have an orgasm just by looking at her from across the room? Can Whoa. he go for three hours straight of, with sexual intercourse? Like if you haven't hit all of those milestones, you've still got plenty of things that you can learn and level up with. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So apparently I have a little bit of room to grow. <laughs> Now, so when you say a man going for three hours, is that with, without having an orgasm? Or are you saying men can have multiple orgasms or should have multiple orgasms? Well, the, I, the absolute ideal for men is to be able to orgasm without ejaculation. Like in some ancient tantric and Taoist schools, they believe that men lose a lot of energy through especially excessive ejaculation. Like I church teach a lot of breathing techniques and energy movement techniques that help men to retain a lot of that energy, even if they do ejaculate. But a lot of people would say that it's best if you can separate them. Many of the best of both worlds, you still have an orgasm, but you don't ejaculate. So wait so, a minute, did I just hear you right, Kim? You're saying that men can have, have an orgasm without ejaculating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, you, you got to give me a little more on that. Tell, tell me more about that. Tell me more about the breath. Tell me more about that part. So in this idea of building stamina, the biggest tool that men have to build stamina is breathing. So that means that as you're building in your sex play, whether you're self-pleasuring you're with your partner, you breathe. And so most people tend to hold the breath breathe really shallow and tighten up the body as they are you know moving towards orgasm and so then they typically get to orgasm they have they have feel like they don't have any control in that 7 to 10 zone it's like zero is non arousal 10 is orgasm and then oops i just went over the edge like again right and so what we're doing is getting men to work with the breath and so that they can slowly build up their level of threshold so let's say for most guys a seven out of 10 is where they're close to orgasm, but not yet in danger of going over the edge. And so especially when they get to that place of let's say a seven, they breathe, they take lots of long, steady, deep breaths, inhale, four counts, exhale, four counts, recirculate that energy in the body. And that brings their, makes them subside a couple notches, like let's say down to a six or a five. And then they start again, breathing or moving up to orgasm. When they get to that edge, they breathe, they breathe, they breathe. And eventually men can get to the place where they say build from a seven to a 7.5 to an eight to an 8.5 to a nine, 9.5, 9.8, 9.9. And they can hover at a 9.9 for hours. So they can be just almost dipping their toe into the whole orgasmic experience and hover there. And that's what women need. They need to get penetrated for a long amount of time to get to these deeper, especially cervical orgasms. So what eventually happens is that when a man is learning and is able to master hovering at that edge for that length of time, he'll eventually just have the orgasm, but not have his his ejection, his ejaculation, and he'll maintain his erection. I mean, some men, I, you know, of rare amounts of men can like ejaculate and then reboot very quickly. But that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being able to have internal, you know, orgasms and ejaculations and just keep going, you know, and I've had partners who could go for like, you know, have eight internal orgasms and no ejaculations, which would mean like hours and hours of very on the edge, wild headboard slamming doggy style kind of sex where, 
you know, most guys would be like, oh, doggy style, my, my kryptonite, you know, and like within five minutes, they, they're gone. No, 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 you can go for literally hours in those positions. And that's when I talk about the three hour sex date. Some people are like, oh, what, like what, three hours straight sex? And I'm like, well, if you take my work, yes. But like, <laughs> otherwise you do some massages, you do some oral sex, you do some manual play. Like I mentioned, Vioni massage and lingo massage. And then yes, intercourse. And then the more masterful you get, the longer amount of time. So all of this is because yes, it feels good, but the larger benefit than that is that you're learning to harvest this energy. The longer that you have sex for, the more, whether that's oral, manual, penetrative, whatever, is you, and you learn and use these breathing techniques I talk about, you recirculate that energy in the body and you harvest it. And then you have it available to infuse into all parts of your life. And so this is where I often say the relationship between your sex life and every other part of your life is tantamount because once you're tuning into this energy and you channel it out, everything gets better. Obviously, your intimate relationships get better. You get more patience and loving as a parent. Children pick up on when there are sexual difficulties within the relationship, even if the parents try to hide it, children know exactly what they don't, they don't know consciously, oh, mama's not giving enough blowjobs. Like, no, they don't know that. But they know that something is amiss. Something isn't cohesive and connected in that relationship that's supposed to be very their main container, right? The couple's energy is what contains the, the, the safety, really, of the, of the children. And when they're all discordant, that creates and gives out an energy of not being safe to the children. So I knew when I knew I went on a little tangent and had to come back to, okay, every other part of your world. So like your business, right? Like I say, my business is fueled by my vagina, obviously because I'm a sex coach, but because I use my sexual energy in a creative way out in the world. And overall, you just present as a different energy, right? Like I talk about the well-fucked woman. There's also the well-fucked man. There's certain kind of radiance of, you know, magnetism, vitality, beauty that's flowing through someone who's having great sex and wearing that great sex. And to me, great sex isn't just like busting out an orgasm to porn. To me, great sex is what I call gourmet sex, where you have like a multi-dimensional connection with your partner, emotional, physical, spiritual, psychological, and you're so deeply, openly surrendered and connected that that creates what I call gourmet sex versus junk food sex, which would be like busting out an orgasm to porn and, you know, furtively in the middle of the night kind of thing. What is a healthy amount of sex to be having, in your opinion, you know, for a married couple, let's say they've been married for a decade, right? Um, what is a healthy amount of sex? What should they be striving for? Every day. Yeah. Every day, even twice a day, like the morning and the evening, the Taoists used to have they called this, have this phrase, the, the sexual prayer, you know, morning to wake up and start off your day. And then in the evening to connect and kind of send yourselves off into the dream state. I would say a minimum of three to four times a week. If a couple was having sex less than that, then to me, that would be a red flag, that there's some level of disconnection. And, you know, before people pipe up with, but I'm really busy, um, let me tell you a story. So I had a couple come to one of my Bali retreats and they had both just come out of second marriages or no, first, first miserable marriages where they'd been together with their partners for about 10 or 15 years. And they sexless, dead, you know, duty type marriages, had kids, stayed together for the kids kind of thing. But then both of them hit a wall and had the courage to leave, right? So they stepped out into the world, they met each other, they connected, and they both were really committed to having a, an amazing relationship. Shit, right they both came out of like never going to do that again you know what they came from into we're going to put everything into this new relationship so between them they had five children because they came like the Brady Bunch and they both worked really high powered jobs he was the CEO of a giant corporation she was upper level management and they had sex every single day every single day without exception because they prioritized it. So, you know, before people start like, but we're so busy, we have young kids, we have busy jobs. Like, no, 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 I don't accept your bullshit excuses. They are excuses. If you're committed, you'll do it. You know, that's it. And if you allow other things to creep into the space, those are your excuses that you're allowing to run your life. What do you say to a guy who maybe doesn't feel attracted to his partner anymore? 
you know, that, uh, he's in a, you're, you're in a place where it's like, Hey, you got to step up, but he's just thinking, I'm not, I love the person, but I'm not really attracted to them. So I don't want to engage physically with them. I love who they are. I love our, you know, our life, but they're just not attracted to that person. Well, then I would want to know why not? Like, were they ever, you know, was, and then what happened? Like I said, some people actually do get together as, friends, I guess. And they, because it's this safety, they can kind of hide there. And so in a situation like that, I don't know if it'll ever be there because it never was there. Right. Mm -hmm. But for say a couple where it was there and then it's now gone, or like you're saying from the male perspective, like, well, what happened? You know, when did that start to go away? And then you have to try to trace back the sequence of events that led to that. Right. Because if you're really honest about it, it didn't just happen right? Like a bunch of things led to that situation where now you're not feeling that. Yeah. And in my work, I talk a lot about radical honesty. And I give this analogy of a clear pane of glass. So that imagine between two people, there's this clear giant window of glass. I'm on one side, you're on the other side. And every time that one of those people tells a lie or a sin of omission or doesn't fully show up and be honest, it puts a splotch of mud on the glass, right? And then another one and another one and another one and another one. And if that goes on for years, they've now built a wall between the two of them. And so, you know, desire completely evaporates with that going on. And so if people have defaulted to a don't ask, don't tell, I don't want to rock the boat kind of energy, that usually leads to a lack of desire because they're just living literally in a room full of lies and unresolved stuff, right? Like, you know, when, when a big thing in my work is getting people to go back and then trying to like look at that wall and be like, okay, big job, but like, where do we start? All right, well, let's start with this thing that I just secretly see about and have for the last five years, but I would really like to, well, maybe not like to get it out in the open, but I encourage people then to get it out in the open and talk about it and right. to really go through that process of, because it'll never get better. It'll never, ever get better unless that happens. So basically what happens at that point is they resign themselves to a sexless marriage. Usually one person will go out and start having affairs or both will, and they stay together for the kids and the money and their social standing, whatever. But that's not feeding anybody. And eventually that takes a toll, right? Kids start acting out. People start developing mysterious health problems. Money starts to drain away because it's like when the energy of the relationship is strong and powerful, it feeds everything else around it. When yeah. it's not, when it's like not healthy, when the people aren't having sex, when they have lots of unresolved issues between them, it sucks everything else into it like a vortex. Mm -hmm. And people don't make that connection because society doesn't make that connection. Medicine doesn't make that connection, right? But I make that connection. And that's why I do so well in my work is because I do make that connection and then I help people to heal it. Now, I, I want to stick on this radical honesty. Thanks for that transition. That was really nice. You're good at this. <laughs> <laughs> You're a total pro, Kim. You're a total pro. Uh, it was great. I love working with pros. Um, so let's talk about this for a second because I, I get this is a big subject and I'm looking at the clock and I'm paying attention here. But you know, let's talk about this radical honesty, because is it possible to have an amazing relationship without being totally honest? Like, where is a secret actually a benefit to the relationship? Where is it like, um, you know, I'm trying to think of examples, like my wife goes out with her girlfriends, and I'm, I don't need to know what they talk about, right? Um, there's yeah. moments where you don't have to tell your partner everything. Um, and, and, and I've re really wrestled with this out of integrity. Like, well, what do I say? What do I not say? Where is it just like, oh, she doesn't need to know that. I, but then there's the lying by omission. Like I didn't say it, but then I'm kind of lying because of that, because I didn't say it. Right. There's a, I think that's a really gray area for some people as to how honest to be, because I think there's also a fear of what happens with your partner when you're fully open. Right. And, and you feel like this, this, if I, if I tell them this, this could be the end of it. Well, sorry, I didn't realize I had my email open. I'm just going to close that. Okay. You can edit that little bit out if you like. No problem. Um, okay. So that's a great question. And 
my view is that anything that's directly pertinent to the relationship and your desires in the relationship needs to be talked about. So let's say, for example, your partner did something that kind of offended you or irritated you, it's related to you, like talk about that, bring that stuff up. You know, or there's desires that you want, you know, things that you want to have happen either sexually or overall in your life. Like you talk about all that stuff. That's really, really important stuff to be constantly keeping the conversation open about. The effluvia of your day, no, I, I agree. That stuff is you go out with your guy friends or she goes out with her girlfriends. Like you don't need a play-by-play -play of like, I went grocery shopping today and then I bought spaghetti and I wasn't sure to get the kamut spaghetti or the quinoa spaghetti, but then I went with the kamut spaghetti and you're like, don't need to do that. And there's actually a deliberate um, cultivation of mystery in that as well is when you're omitting on purpose details of the effluvia of your life you're creating a little bit of mystery right like that person went out and did something and you don't need to know everything and like that's okay so I think that kind of admin effluvia of your life like that doesn't need a play-by-play -play with your partner what does need constant checking in with is anything regarding the tenor of your relationship. It affects if it's affecting how you feel about your partner, you know, how you feel about yourself even. And if that stuff, sometimes you can talk about that stuff with friends and not bring it to your partner. If you can really resolve it, that's okay. But if it's really to do with your partner in a way that they need to hear so that they can respond or alter something or support you, then yes, you might have emotional issues. You don't have to bring all of those to your partner. You can talk about them with friends or a coach or a therapist again, but if it's really relevant to them. So I know it's a little bit hard to distinguish those ways, but like, you know, anything that's directly pertinent, yes, random, whatever stuff, I actually wouldn't talk about it with the partner because it just fills up the space with too much familiarity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kim, I know you talk about a lot of this a, a lot of the time, right? Some of these things are like you've repeated these thoughts and ideas and you've shared them multiple times with multiple groups. What are you excited about right now? What's really capturing your heart? What's new and exciting for you in this space? Something you're studying, something you're learning, what's, what's catching your eye? Well, right, I just started a mentorship program this year and people have been asking me to do some kind of teacher training program for years and I just hadn't felt drawn to do it and then I was this year and I made it as a teacher training pro like prefer professionals so people who are doctors naturopaths OBGYNs counselors coaches who want to be able to work with people but then they're missing this giant piece of that intimacy and sexuality that even people in coaching professions or counseling professions or even doctors even OBGYNs aren't really taught about in a deep way ironically and yeah. so that's what I've really been digging my teeth into lately is I'm in the middle of that program and just being able to work with, you know, peers of sorts, right? Like colleague type people and chat about these things on a much deeper level, like the kind of the deepest possible level of what I'm trying to convey so that we can also put out there a group of people because we often get asked, like I get asked if I do one-on-one -on -one work and I don't, but then people get asked, well, can you recommend someone? And I can't because the type of, philosophy that I have isn't just run of the mill where I can just say go see such and such a counselor like I want to have people really schooled up in my way of thinking and my protocols so that they're going at this from this radically holistic perspective right and I mean I'm so passionate about it because I get results like I don't just use band-aids on people I don't just give them like light superficial home play to do, I make them dig deep. And because of the digging deep, they have very radical transformation. So I want to be able to help disseminate that in other ways. Obviously, I have my own work, my podcast and my teachings and my, my platform, my, my courses online, but I'd like to be able to also now educate people to do this one on one and one on two. Well, I love that you're, we mentioned it earlier, but you've got this sexual mastery for men. Um, that's actually, as we record this, it's, it's coming up later this month or next month. I think it starts at the end of this month. Okay. The end of this month. So this is real timely. Um, how would somebody know if that's the next step for them? Right? Like oh, what, so the how end of September, the end of September. Yeah. Okay, cool. 
Yeah. Well, that's good. As we release this, you guys will have, you know, a couple of weeks to get registered and get in there. But um, I'm fascinated by this. So I, I would love to go through the program. Somebody's out there saying, hey, is this for me? What type of thing? What am I going to learn there? What are we going to explore? Uh, you know, maybe maybe they feel really competent in this area. Maybe they feel like they've got a really dynamic relationship. They're like, they're, they are level 10 in the arena of sex. Who knows? But what would you say to the you know to everybody out there listening about that sexual mastery for men course? Well, it's the ultimate course to gain mastery, like all of the things about sex and sexuality that we ought to have been taught, but we're not. And so for men, it really goes into how to own your masculine energy, how to occupy that space in yourself, and then how to portray that energy and interact with your woman with that energy. We go into all those different orgasms I spoke about, like everything from sure clitoral, but then G spot, ejaculation, cervical orgasms, how to get there, how to really support a woman, you know, like how to open up a woman energetically and then create that container. Like I said, how to be constantly conveying that mantra of if you fall, I will catch you. And how for men to take their sexual energy and use it in their own lives, right? I talked about channeling that energy out into the world. So using it in your business, using it to boost your financial standing, using it to become a better parent and a better partner and just a better human out into the world. So how do you take that tangible energy and spread it out into everything that you do? So it's like all of this stuff about how to become more of your own true self and authentic masculine and then how you interact with your partner at the same time. And I would say that most of this stuff, unless you've done a, a lot of sexual teaching, it's next level for most people. Like the stuff that I talk about you know, like I said with you, like separating orgasm from ejaculation or giving a woman 30 cervical orgasms in a row. Like that's not in the realm of normal for most people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're probably right <laughs> about that. But that's why people come to see you. So that's great. Um, Kim, let's talk for a moment as we wrap here for the guys that are out there and they're part of our group. They're, you know, we get together for these retreats. We get together in small groups. We have a lot of one-to-one -one conversations. We have trainings within Front Row Dads, uh, and a lot of it is on these subjects. Um, and, and I think guys are gonna really dig your material here. But what type of conversations could they be having or should they be having with each other, right? Like if you were to say, guys, when you're, you know, do you have thoughts about that? I, I know you're not a dude and I know you're not in that space, but would you have a thought about, hey, when, when guys are getting together, what types of questions should they be asking? What maybe what type, what types of questions should be they be asking themselves and their buddies around this subject? Because I think a lot of people don't want to talk about it. It's kind of like, hey, did you catch the last UFC fight? But not, hey, how, how many times did you have sex this week with your wife? You know. I mean, I think a great place to start where I think men really do need an outlet to talk about it, and maybe you guys are already, but this real, this masculine piece, like in this modern world where there's been a backlash against masculinity, and now there's become this, there's this whole gender neutralization idea, it's like, like, what does it mean to be a man? Like, what, you know, where do I feel comfortable being? What do I feel uncomfortable being? Like, I think men need a real outlet to have those discussions. Because if I was a man and I was looking at all of that going on right now, I'd be like, well, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Right. You know, like, what am I allowed to do now? You know? And look, I mean, the obvious things aside of like, not hitting on women in the workplace. Like, I think that's kind of a given, but I mean, outside of that, like in even how you might conduct yourself in general at work, but like also obviously within your partnership and, you know, what does that look like to be, to really, you know, rewild oneself, like to reconnect to that masculine energy and then be radiating that out into the world. I think that's a great conversation for men to have. And then of course, like wherever they feel comfortable to go and having these sexual conversations, like, you know, in my experience, when somebody opens up that door to start a conversation about sex, people usually jump in because they're so desperate to have these conversations and they so want to have them that as soon as somebody just opens up the door, they're like, they might be a little shocked at first. Like, did you actually just say what I thought you just said? But then they're like, oh, wait a sec. This is awesome. It's like reality changing because most people don't talk about these things. So yeah. I encourage you to go first. And if there's something that you want to discuss or get a friend or a colleague or whatever, like a group within your group opinion on, 
just go for it and bring it up and then see what people say. Like, what are your top tips for building stamina? How long can you really go for it? You know, like, what do you, and like, the answer is not thinking about football. The answer is thinking about breathing and cultivating a new way of being, a new relationship with your sexual energy. So, um, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is like you just, the person next to you wants to have this conversation as much as you do, but somebody yeah. has to start it. So be the one to start it. So I want to give you the final words here, Kim, and, and thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And Tim, if you're out there listening, thank you so much for introducing <laughs> me to Kim and her work, um, because there's no doubt that it's made a huge difference uh, for me and my wife and our family. So thank you for- Hi, your- Tim. Thank you for your work. Uh, Tim, Tim also threw some questions my way, which helped shape this interview, which I think was really great. Um, and there's so many more things that we can get into, but the good news is you've got courses for this. You've got videos for this. You've got resources for people to go tap into. I've enjoyed your podcast. Not every episode's for me as a dad and as a husband, but there are some in there that are really good. And even the ones I've tried to dig into where I'm like, that title doesn't necessarily apply to me directly, but maybe it does because if it matters to my wife, it matters to me. You know, you mean I like can... the one about shooting ping pong balls with your vagina? As yeah, a exactly. That's skill. exactly. You weren't <laughs> sure if that one applied to you, but then you I was listened. Like, to do it, I but really need actually, to know how to do that? It does apply to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting because, I mean, we didn't even get into a lot of the stuff that makes you such a fascinating person, like the weightlifting. You know, if you just go check out your your Instagram, I mean, I had to really like, I did a triple take. The first time I went to your Instagram, I'm like, oh, what's happening here? <laughs> and it's totally not even on my radar, just not even on my radar, that that's even a thing, uh, vaginal weightlifting. But it's what's, what's interesting is I think this gives me to learn more about women, right? It doesn't have to be just about me to learn what it is to be a man or, or what I need to do, but to learn how women think and what they need and what they want. And, you know, uh, all parts of a woman, if I can become fascinated and curious there, I think that's really good. So anyway, my point is, thank you so much for providing all these resources. We're, we're much better off because of you. Um, and my wife, again, as I said, is very happy because uh, I've, I've been introduced to your work. And, you know, for final words here, what would you like to say to the guys? Anything at all, the floor is yours. There's guys out, there's thousands of guys listening to this right now. Um, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to think about? What action do you want them to take? Aside from definitely go sign up for Sexual Mastery for Men. Well, your woman really wants your masculine strength and power. And, you know, one of the number one skills I said that you can cultivate is stamina, is sexual stamina, being able to go the distance in sex and not get thrown off course. And then think about that question that I asked, you know, are you constantly communicating to your woman in some form energetically? If you fall, I will catch you. Like, think about that question and what that means and how you show up that way in your life and in your relationship. And do you honestly feel like you are inhabiting your masculine energy? And are there ways that you feel like you're holding back? And why is that? And then I would either talk about that stuff or both with your, your group or, and also with your woman of like, you know, I want to like have that polarity conversation and I want to start stepping more into this. Like, how does that look for this? And like, I'd like to start doing this. Are you okay with that? You know, or, or however that goes, but I would really address that because I think, you know, one of the major things that I found is that when a man is really showing up in his masculinity, in his bed, that shows up in his erection. So a man who's like really self-possessed and strong and confident and sexually confident, that's the erection. When he's not all of those things, that's the erection. And so there's a very direct relationship between how we show up in bed and how we show up in life and vice versa. And so that's our barometer. The cock is the barometer. So even look at your cock as a barometer and see what it's telling you. And then that's your answer. Wow. Kim, thank you so much. Guys, please go sign up for Sexual Mastery for Men. We'll put all the links for this over at frontrowdads.com underneath uh, the episode here that Kim has been so uh, you know, uh, giving here and her, her wisdom and her openness. I'm so grateful here, Kim, for this conversation. Thank you again for being with us. And um, I look forward to connecting with you down the road. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, and one more thing, Kim, we'll have all the links to everything, of course, at Front Row Dads, but where do you guys go connect with you? What podcast, what's the name of the podcast and your site? 
Yep, so it's kimanami.com, and under Sexual Savant Salons, you'll find the Sexual Mastery for Men, the online e-course and eight-week program that's held online. And then my podcast is called Orgasmic Enlightenment, iTunes, Spotify, whatever other mediums. And then my YouTube channel is also a great source of information, and I have a Sexual Mastery for Men playlist on the YouTube channel, which would be of great interest. Cool. And guys, when you listen to Kim's podcast, do not have it on uh, your speaker <laughs> in your car when your kids are in the car. That's not <laughs> the opening is quite, uh, you know, we changed the opening. Pitchy. Oh, well, some of the older episodes still have it. But actually, we heard that several times that um, people were playing it out in public. <laughs> we're like, I, did, All right, I well, had my kids in the car. You. I had my kids in the car and I was like, oh, let me just, right. And it was, it was literally like, I just plugged my phone in. I wasn't, and it just started playing. And uh, I was like, whoa, <laughs> so, they're, they're great. They had, you know, they just, it sounded like excited people. It sounded like. It, people. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Working out hard. Yeah, but it's a uh, it's it's a really great show. You've done a fantastic job with that, and uh, thanks for being with us all the way from Bali today. So thanks for making time. 